And I found a long time ago there's one way to use that, to take care of a computer. Just get a bigger hammer. <laughs> it works every time. I need a bigger hammer for that, too. <laughs> well, I do want to thank Brother Jordan uh, for all the years I've been able to speak here. He's asked us to speak, and uh, we go back, I think, uh, to 1988. And uh, we started back down home then, and it was hot and dry that year. And uh, we was fortunate to have had a little bit of a rain and a lot of them only had 65 bushel of corn, but right there we had 165. So uh, we've gone a little above that by now. But uh, a little bit about the reason I wasn't here yesterday until we got here. Uh, my aunt died, and uh, she was the second one in the last three weeks. And uh, she was 95, so it was not something that was unexpected. And I have three more aunts that are 95 on one side of the family or the other. So uh, it's going to happen again rather soon. So uh, I don't know. On, on one of them, I do have the funeral for. So uh, we'll see how things go. But uh, yesterday morning, about this time, the funeral started, and they... Uh, Undertaker called for the preacher to come up, and this lady starts walking up there. And uh, I thought, well, that'd be about right for what denomination it was. And uh, she was wearing a, I think she had a black skirt on and so forth, and polka dot top and everything. And I thought, happy hippo has returned. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't want the rest of the family to know <laughs> too much about that, but uh, <laughs> uh, she uh, evidently didn't know First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. Uh, so uh, I thought if I'd have had time, uh, we was going to go to the cemetery, but I decided let's get on going up to Chicago. I'd rather be up there anyway. So, so I didn't have a chance to talk to her. So, uh, well, let's turn to the uh, God's, what do we got here? Got to look at that. God's prophetic calendar. It's not over yet, and it isn't. There's a lot left. And turn, if you will, to uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. And uh, if I sound a little strange this morning, why, well, I, I sound just normal. And because <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, as we begin our study this morning. We thank you for all you've done for us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the eternal hope that we have in him. And we thank you for the word that you've given to us. And as we look at it this morning, let us look at every word, how every word ends, that we might bring honor and glory to you in our study. For in our Savior's name we ask. Amen. Years ago, and I think I said this before, uh, Fred Beckmar asked me to speak down there in Florida for him. And uh, this lady came up to him a few weeks later and said, uh, you know that guy that was there from Georgia? And he spoke for us. And he told about, she, or she told about what I spoke on. And everything. He said he wasn't from Georgia. He was from East Central Illinois. <laughs> no, I heard him speak. He was from Georgia. <laughs> well, I've been from East Central Illinois all my life, except for the time I've been away from there. And uh, if I sound like I'm from Georgia, why, well, uh, I'm welcome to Georgia anyway, whether I'm welcome around here at home or not. So we've had a rash of funerals, and uh, we've had, seemed like in a small community like ours, they go in threes. We've had two neighbors die in the last 10 days, and we've got one more to go. So, so long. <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter 11. Before I go, I'm going to give you this. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, when you study God's word, you want to see what every word is and how each and every word ends. And I've said that over and over and over. 
and I've meant that every time I've said it. Is it past tense, present tense, future tense? Is it singular? Is it plural? And so on and so forth. And some of them have hit on that already, and I wasn't even here. So uh, maybe they're getting on to that too. Because it's very important whether we understand where God is talking about the future, the present, or the past. Is he talking about us, or is he talking about somebody else? Now, as we got the chart up here, we see that the Gentiles pretty well stay on this line here. But the Jewish people come over here. Now, they understood this dispensational change. The Jewish people understood that dispensational change. Now, that's a, uh, well, it used to be a 50-cent word when I was a kid. Now, it's a $5 word because of inflation. Uh, a dispensation is simply what God is dispensing. And that's what we need to keep in mind when we hear that word dispensation. The Apostle Paul uses it four times. And uh, we need to be very sure of what it says and explain it to so many other people because they don't understand what that means. Now, they understood that the uh, person of Abraham or Abram was called out back then. He was given some promises. They understood that dispensation. And they go along like this. Israel was given the law, but they don't understand this dispensational change. Right. Something happened here for God to offer his grace to everyone. And that's for you and for me. Now, let's see some of the things that happened for the nation of Israel. That's going to happen for the nation of Israel. Not right now. For I would not Brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What's a mystery? Well, in God's word, it's a secret that he kept from mankind, from everyone, until a certain point in time. Then he revealed it. So he's revealed that mystery. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. Now, he said, I don't want you. He didn't say, I want you to be dumb. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. What's the difference between dumb and ignorant? Well, dumb is like me. You can't figure it out. Ignorant means that you can figure it out if it's shown to you and you can see it. Well, he didn't want the members of the body of Christ to be ignorant about this. He wanted them to understand what God was going to do, what he was about to do with the nation of Israel had they been obedient to him. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now, you know what a conceited person is? About everybody understands what a conceited person is. Did you ever go to school and have some girls in your class that were somewhat conceited? Yeah, well, we did too. Yeah, enough said there. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now, blindness in part has happened to Israel. They can't see the wall in front of them because they're blind. They don't understand those things because if you ever watch a person that's blind, if he don't have that dog with him, what's going to happen to him? He's probably going to get run over or something with a Mack truck or something. But he says, blindness in part has happened to Israel. Not all of them have been blinded. The whole of the nation has not been blinded. And today, that's very true. And when you find uh, a person that's an offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob today, and he understands the grace truth, you aren't going to shake that man for no matter what you tell him. He understands what God is doing. And he is a great man to have behind you, alongside of you, on either side. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until. Now, there's two things that talks about, the scriptures talk about the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles. I'm going to leave it with you. I don't have time to spend on that this morning to uh, explain all the differences. But are they the same or are they different? If they were the same, God would use the same term, wouldn't he? Well, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. 
And so all Israel shall be saved. Now, many people think that that's every Jew that there is. All Israel shall be saved. Now, go back to uh, Romans chapter 9. Oh. Let's start with verse 4. The part that I want is the last part of verse 6. But we're going to look at this. And you may, the problem of being the last one or the speaker of the last day, you don't uh, have a, a verse that somebody else hadn't already used. Well, we're going to use it again. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? And that was one of the things that Alan was talking about a while ago. And the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the servants of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is it over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are all of Israel. They're not all Israel, which are all of Israel. Now, how's that going to work? You need, you're talking about scratching your head, you're going to scratch your head on that one. If they're not all Israel, that are of Israel. Who's Israel anyway? Let's go back. Sometimes somebody has made a statement that I can't preach without uh, going back to the book of Genesis. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to find some answers here. And in Genesis chapter 32... If I can get this, I hope this Bible lasts as long as I do. I don't know whether it will or not. In Genesis chapter 32, uh, Jacob is about ready to meet his brother, his twin brother, Esau. And he's divided his family into two groups. So if Esau comes and attacks one of them, you others run because I'm going to keep half of you. And then he's got a bunch of sheep and goats and cattle and donkeys and camels out in front of him and he's kept them all separate and he's got space between each one of them. Then we get down to verse 24 and Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day and when he saw that he prevailed not against him he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and he wrestled with him and he said let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go. And now this is Jacob talking. I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? He said, Jacob. Oh, do you think Jacob didn't know what his name was? Do you know what your name is? Why do you suppose that's there? Because something great was going to happen. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou hast dost ask me, ask after my name? And he blessed him there. So the offspring of Jacob, that would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are the spiritual people. Now, what's coming back to Romans chapter uh, nine, and he talks about these people, and he says, they are not all Israel that are of Israel. In other words, they're not all spiritual people that are of the offspring of the man named Israel. So as you understand that, you see, how that statement can be made. And you understand why God said it. So all of the people of Israel are not spiritual people. And as you get into the book of the Revelation, you can see that. Because how many of them take the mark of the beast? A whole bunch of them. Now, Let's come back to Romans chapter 10. Look a little bit more at this verse. And so all Israel shall be saved in verse 26. 
as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, saith the Lord. Turn to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 and verse, well, the last two verses in the chapter. Isaiah 59. And the last two verses. Because there's a, an interesting statement made here. And the Redeemer shall come, out of, to, uh, shall come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now notice what that says. The Redeemer shall come to Zion. And he's going to turn away the ungodliness. Transgression of them that uh, turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So who's that going to leave? If it's a spiritual part, it's going to leave the spiritual part of Israel only. Now, many people say that today, God has taken us and replaced Israel with what he's doing, with the prophetic program. No, he hadn't. If he did that, would Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 be right? God who cannot lie. That'd be a lie in itself, wouldn't it? So God, there's only been one place in Scripture where anybody ever replaced someone else. That's right here. And you know who he replaced? That's the Lord Jesus Christ took our sins and took the penalty for our sins, and we don't have to. We don't have to. Now, man has that choice. He can or he, he don't have to. And that's some of the things you've been hearing the last uh, day or so. But as we have this covenant with God given to the nation of Israel, what is it that he says? Well, let's go back to... Uh, Oh, let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 31. What did I say, Ezekiel? Let's go to Jeremiah. <laughs> we'll try to get this right thing right here before we get done. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31, that's what we want. If I can get my pages to turn right. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, why is the two households? Why the household of Israel and the house of... I pondered over that for years before I finally figured out what it was. Where's the lion of the tribe of blank coming from? Judah. It was two nations, or two tribes that stayed true to God when the nation split, wasn't they? What were they? Benjamin, and who was the other one? Judah. Okay. So why does Judah need to be lined up right? When the Lord chose the 12 apostles, did he choose one from each of the 12 tribes? There's three sets of brothers, wasn't there? Well, that should tell you there's three tribes not even mentioned there. But did they all come from the same tribe? I don't know for sure. But it couldn't have all come from each one of the tribes. So the tribes were not represented as a tribe in the 12. But the 12 are given responsibility over those 12 tribes. Well, look at here. let's look at the rest of this here in uh, uh, Jeremiah 31. And they, they, God's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I wasn't husband unto them, saith the Lord. Now, that answers a lot of questions right there. The Lord took them by the hand and he brought them across the Red Sea. 
But he says, I was a husband unto him. Now, who's the bride of Christ? Right there, it says it's Israel. Because who did he bring across the Red Sea? The Gentiles? Oh, yeah, he gave them a kind of a drowning, didn't he? Uh, they talk about baptism today. You got to either be sprinkled, splattered, dunked, or drowned, or half drowned, or whatever. And I've been all the that didn't do a lick of good for me. All it did was got me wet. And I can do that in the shower every day. And I need to, too. Uh, <laughs> well, when you get out and you. What occupation is it that uh, God speaks of most in the scriptures? Farming. What did he have Adam do? He had to go to farming, didn't he? Why? That's a result of what? A curse. So I'm a cursed farmer. <laughs> we raise corn and soybeans. And Alan's got a few hogs for the boys. And Well, they smell real good, too. But as we see what it says when it says, By the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. It doesn't say sweat of your brow. It says sweat of your face. Anybody can have a few perspiration spots on your forehead. But if you can go to sweating and it run down your face, you've really been working. And if you don't think so, come down there and I'll put you behind a baler and we'll buck some bales for, uh, put you on there by yourself. Stack them four high in a tie, and uh, we'll see how you're sweating like when you get done with that first load. Now you got ten more loads out there. <laughs> this covenant is not going to be like the one that I made with them to start with. What covenant is he talking about? He's talking about this covenant back here with Noah. And with Abraham, and with Moses. I'm not going to make a covenant like that one with Moses. Here's going to be the covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Where did he write this law back here with Moses? On what? Stone. Where did he say he's going to write this? How many of the nation of Israel, the true Israel, is he going to write that in their hearts? Only those that believe every time. That's the covenant. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his neighbor or brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. The youngest to the oldest, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Turn over to chapter 32. Oh, about uh, verse 37. Jeremiah 32, 37. We've got some more detail about this covenant here. God says, I'm not going to do, I'm going to, it's going to be a different covenant. I'm going to put my law in their inward parts and they're going to do it. They're going to be my people and I'll be their God. How many times, well, first of all, what was that small group of people God called them when he said that they would follow him? The little what? Flock. Little flock. You've got this flock and you've got this one. So we're going to look at that in a minute. About a minute and a half. Behold, and verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries whither I have driven them in mine anger, in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Did that happen in 1948? How many of you here remember that? <laughs> not many of us. I better quit asking that question. <laughs> Who was the mainspring behind that? And it wasn't the United States either. Yeah, England. They wanted Israel to have their own homeland. 
Is that the beginning of what this verse is talking about? No, it is not. Don't ever confuse what man has done with what God is doing and has done. And that's exactly what people is finding wrong and how's come they're messing things up on this chart. I will give him one heart and one way. You remember we said that from the youngest to the oldest is going to be saved? They're going to have one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children. What? After them. Keep those verses in mind. And I will make an everlasting cut. Now, how long is this going to be? Everlasting. It's not going to be just for a little dab of time. It's not. Uh, they used to talk about beer cream. I think I used too much of it because I got nothing up there to put it on anymore. A little dab will do you, you know. Well, it done me. <laughs> Now I'll make an everlasting covenant with them and that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I shall put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. Read the rest of it in your free time. But when you study the Word of God, read that verse and find where it belongs in its context. Come back to uh, Romans chapter 10. Now, we've looked at the first two verses here, or the first three verses what God's going to do, how he's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is his covenant. It's his covenant. And you can find that, again, in Isaiah chapter 59 in the last two verses. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Oh, well, that's not good, is it? They're enemies. Now, who's Paul writing to here? He's writing to the Romans. Aren't they Gentiles and members of the body of Christ? Yeah. So he says, they're enemies for your sakes. How many of you have had a, a Jewish friend come to you and tell you about the, God's plan of salvation today? I don't see one hand. Mine don't go up either. Because it was a Gentile that told me about that. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Now those few that are never going to turn their back on God, that are members of the body of Christ, are part of the election. Who's the election? Who's those that are elected? That's those saved that God has a purpose for and a responsibility, and I've heard denominational preachers say that when I get to heaven, I'm going to find a tree and sit down under that tree and uh, uh, fish in a, in a river forever. I don't even want to go there if it's going to be like that. Well, he's not going to do it either because God has a responsibility did you ever see God give a man uh, anything without a responsibility that went with it? We don't have salvation just to be saved. Uh, years ago, there was a, what do you call that, fire escape, a, a group of, in, a, in a college that, uh, what was they doing? They was escaping the flames of hell. And that's all that was talked about. Well, that's a start. But what about this? What about when we get down to here and we get up to here? Why aren't they finding out what's going on up there? You see, there's a purpose for everything that God has done. For as in time past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. The Romans received God's plan of salvation why did God bring the Apostle Paul in here? Because the Gentiles didn't want to uh, turn to uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 28. This is talking about our forefathers. Every last one of us is here, unless you're a Jewish uh, person. 
in Romans chapter 1 and verse 28, and you can start in verse 18 and read all down through there and find everything that was wrong with them. And by the way, what do you call a teacher at the University of Illinois or any college or university? A professor? Look over in uh, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What do you got teaching over to colleges and universities? Fools. Look at verse 28. And even though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't even want him in their mind. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, do you know what a reprobate is? Does that word even sound good? It don't even sound good, does it? So you know what a reprobate is. And you go on down through there and read the rest of those verses to the end of the chapter and it takes all of them to find out what a reprobate is. That's what every one of us came from. That's the same condition we were in before we were saved. What has changed since Romans chapter 1 for us? Right there is the only thing that's changed it. We have the grace of God being offered to us for salvation. Now, let's come back to uh, Romans chapter 11. For, in verse 30, For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. So, not only has the Gentiles quit believing, now these people have. What have they done? Well, we talk about the Gentiles being such idol worshipers. What had the nation of Israel, well, what had the offspring of Jacob done with the law? They'd made idols out of parts of it, hadn't they? What had happened to this bunch over here? They was worshiping what? Idols. What was the difference? Just the thing that they was worshiping. And they didn't want to believe God except for a few of them. And what were they called? That little, little flock. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here on this little flock. Go back to, uh, well, I, it took me a long time to decide which way to do this. Go back to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. Now, as we go through the scriptures, uh, verse 21, by the way, Matthew 15, 21. Uh, as we said before, why does God use agriculture as a means to describe things so that people can understand it. Because that was the first thing he gave to whom? Adam. Okay. How many of you have ever, let's say, uh, raised 20 to 25 head of sheep or more? I'm the only one? When he was a kid. All right. Let's read this. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Today, modernists would say she was demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. Wouldn't even talk to her. Why? She was a Gentile. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, she cries after us. Why did he not talk to her? Because she was a Gentile. Well, let's see what else he says. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, you remember when we, back there where we looked at uh, in chapter 9 and verse 6 and said, All Israel is not of Israel? We see here, that he says, he is not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Go to Luke chapter 16, uh, chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And uh, the first verse. Luke 15, verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Oh boy, now we got a real bunch don't hear, don't we? And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Boy, he's about, you can't get much. If he was a snake, you could crawl under him. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What's a parable? A parable is a story with a terrific ending and a lesson to it that the people, that didn't really happen. He says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? So you're going to go out and you're going to find this one sheep. Now, if you've ever had sheep, like I did, we used to all have them uh, when I was a kid, young, long time ago. Uh, why? Before we got these, what we call 40 gig weed mowers, like the lawn mowers of today, we'd uh, use sheep to mow the lots around the buildings and the farm. And those sheep would uh, eat, a lot of times they'd eat most of the weeds before they'd eat the grass. And if mom or your wife had flowers and they'd stick their nose through the fence, you'd see how long their tongues could reach. Because they loved flowers. Man, they'd eat them. Hollyhocks, we used to have hollyhocks. Haven't got a one left. They ate them all. And the only way you can keep a hollyhock around is for it to go to seed. Well, they didn't last that long around them sheep. Anyhow, they'd eat those things. But when they'd eat like that at noon, they'd all lay down, wouldn't they? And go to sleep. And two, maybe two at a time, three at a time, they'd wake up and very quietly they'd walk around the opposite side of the barn or wherever they might be. Except one. Yeah, that was always a lamb. And that stupid thing would beller and ball around there. You never heard such a pathetic cry come from a lamb. He was lost. Now, if there's two of them out there, how many's lost? None. Why? Because they can see each other. But they can't see each other. They're lost. And that stupid lamb would run back and forth in the same track all the time. He's talking about the lost sheep that he was sent to. What were they doing? Running back and forth in the same track all the time and yelling for help. And those lamb, that lamb, how do I know it's a lamb? Well, that's what we read on here. But he leaves the night in nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. Now look at the next verse. And when he hath found it, he layeth it up on his shoulders, rejoicing. Now a ram will weigh around 300 pounds. He's going to pick him up. And boom, boom. Pretty stout guy, isn't he? Especially with that dude kicking you in the face and the eyes and the nose and everything else. Well, you only weighs 150 to 200 pounds. They're going to pick her up and throw him over his shoulder or throw her over his shoulders? You know, you always see a lamb in a picture, don't you? There's a reason for that. You can pick that. How big does a lamb get before you butcher the thing? Well, 100, 115 pounds. And you can usually, you don't take too much to pick up 100 pounds. I used to be able to pick up 300. But I can't do no more. I won't even try it. <laughs> and uh, we had wheel weights on a tractor. They weighed 150 pounds a piece. I'd pick up one in each hand, carry it up, put it on a tractor, and go back and get some more. Can't do that anymore. But, he says, And when he cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Now remember he's who he's talking to. He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, isn't he? 
Did they need to repent in their mind? No. Did you ever see one repent? I know of one or two. But they were the lost sheep of the house of Israel, weren't they? Nicodemus was one of them. And who was the other one? This man right here. But he was he was the lost sheep of the house of Israel? No, he brought in something totally different, didn't he? So, and look at that repentance there. When Israel was asked to repent and be baptized, what was it that they had to repent of? Each and every sin that they committed, what happens? They forgot one. That wasn't what they was to repent of. Nine times. That's that many. That makes her fold that thumb around. Nine times Scripture mentions this sin that they was involved in. It has to do with this thing right here. They were stiff-necked. Peter was not the last one to speak it to them. Stephen was in Acts chapter 7. God talks about Israel being stiff-necked. They wouldn't listen to him. Today we would use the word, word probably bullheaded. They wouldn't listen to God. They wouldn't do what he said. But what's he say, what did we read that he was going to do according to that new covenant that was going to be placed in their hearts? He was going to be their God, and they was going to be his people, right? So as we see the things that come to uh, fruition here, it's not going to be like it was in time past. For as in verse 30, in, Rome, in Romans chapter 11, and I've got four minutes left. For as in time past have not believed, yet now have be obtained mercy through their unbelief. So what happened over here? He calls out the Apostle Paul. Here's where the majority of the denominations and even the people within those denominations make their mistake. They don't recognize this dispensational change. In other words, they don't recognize that God is handing out grace. Salvation is offered to Jew and Gentile alike. Let's read on here. Even so have those, these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Some of these Gentiles today, and more of them every day, don't believe God, but what is going to happen to the nation of Israel? A few of them are going to believe. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. How would we have God's mercy if Israel had accepted the Lord? Would we be going on now? If, if Israel had accepted the Lord back here, where would we be? We wouldn't, would we? We wouldn't even be here. If Israel had obeyed everything God told them to do, we wouldn't even be here. Why? Well, you've got seven years of tribulation and a thousand years of this kingdom, and then the kingdom was going to go. Where would we be today? Where would things be going today? We'd be back, well, we'd be clear off the chart, wouldn't we? Because if this thing was folded up, this wouldn't even be there. So where are we? God is having mercy on, well, how does he say that? For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Notice that word upon. That's just like that little word back there in chapter 9 and verse 6. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. See that little word, the smallest word in there, of if it wasn't in there, you wouldn't understand that verse. It'd be awful difficult to explain it to you. But it is there. And those words are the words that we need to look at. 
Those are the words which we need to understand and to know and be obedient to. Heavenly Father, as we look at the scriptures this morning, we thank you for what you've done for us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that Israel has not been totally forgotten, that you will come back someday and give them the hope that they have and the fulfillment of all the prophecies that are in the Old Testament scriptures and in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we'll give you the honor and glory for it. It's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen.